In 1965, Ford introduced an all-new full-size lineup, and it was the most dramatically new engineered full-size Ford since what was introduced in 1949. And while the 1965 full-size Fords did share their 119-inch wheelbase with the outgoing 1964 models, the entire philosophy behind the design of the 1965 Fords really changed and broke with what Ford had been executing in the past, at least for their division. By this point and across the company, Ford had dabbled with a number of different strategies to try to develop highly isolated rides. One type of strategy was employed on the 1956 Continental Mark IIs that had a full body and frame type construction. This, however, was changed when the Mark III was introduced in 1958. Yes, I did say the Mark III was introduced in 1958. For those who don't know, 1969 was not the first year of the Mark III. In any case, I digress, but in 1958, Ford went to a different unitized body strategy for Lincolns that continued on through the suicide door Continentals that were produced through 1969. However, for 1965, Ford wanted to provide its customers with a ride that was highly isolating. And while an ad campaign would subsequently be developed that compared these Fords to Rolls Royces in terms of their overall quietness, hitting the level of quiet found in a Rolls Royce wasn't necessarily the objective of Ford engineers, although it was a lofty goal at the time. In order to attain this objective of a high level of quietness, Ford turned to an engineering strategy that was first used by them on the 1956 Continental Mark II, and frankly, was different from what the other members of the Big Three were employing at the time. More specifically, Ford went to a strategy where the frame on the 1965 Fords was actually a bit flexible as opposed to being rigid. On past Fords, the frame was made purposely rigid in order to provide the total strength that underpinned the vehicle. However, for the 1965 design, the engineers purposefully left the frame somewhat flexible. As a consequence, they had to make the body of the vehicle extremely rigid in order to endow the vehicle with an appropriate level of overall strength. It may seem like a strange strategy, but it actually was quite effective. And by the way, this strategy was also employed by General Motors when it introduced its 1971 full-size vehicles that also had a purposefully more flexible frame than the 1965 to 70 vehicles that came before it. Although I will say that the GM engineers did not quite have the same level of success that Ford enjoyed on these 1965 to 1970 models. In addition to employing a strong body, flexible frame type philosophy in engineering the 1965 Fords, engineers also added torque boxes built into each end of the side rails where they joined the front and rear subframes. The torque boxes enabled noises from the suspension or any vibration to be dampened before they would be transmitted into the cabin. Additional cabin isolation was provided by the fact that Ford's bodies rested on the frame in mounting points only forward of the cowl area and aft of the rear seat. In other words, the body structure had to serve as a bridge between the cowl and the rear package shelf as there were no mounting points to the frame in between those areas. This was a wonderful idea because it endowed the Fords with a ride where individuals would not feel road impacts because there simply were no mounting points between the cowl and the rear package shelf to transmit them into the cabin. Ford also switched to four coil suspension in 1965 from having coils up front and leaf springs in the rear in its vehicles in 1964 and before. The goal in doing so was to further improve the ride and it was interesting and different from what was employed on some of the other Fords prior to that point, including frankly, the Lincolns, which had switched to leaf rear springs in 1960. Further road isolation was made possible by the change in front suspension design. More specifically, Ford had previously used lower A-arms that had two mounting points. In this 1965 Ford, the lower control arms simply had one mounting point on its inboard end. At the rear of the car, axle position was controlled by three longitudinal arms, one on either side of the vehicle and one in the center. This helped also minimize rear end squat during acceleration 
as well as rear end rise and nose dive during braking. The rear axle was also laterally controlled by a rubber bushed track bar that was linked between the axle and the frame. All of these changes added up to a dramatically new body on frame design for the 1965 Fords that really did achieve its objectives, particularly if you're somebody who's driven a Ford of this era, you will recognize how well they ride and how quiet they are compared to other competitive makes of the time period. And in fact, if you drive a 1965 Ford back to back with a 1964 Ford, you can perceive just how old the 1964 feels as really it employs an overall frame and suspension design that dates back to 1957. And in some cases, the front suspension design was quite similar even to what Ford was introducing and producing in 1954. With their quiet ride objective now achieved, Ford turned to their advertising agency, J. Walter Thompson, to develop an appropriate slogan for their new vehicle. What J. Walter Thompson came up with was a slogan that Ford rides quieter than a Rolls Royce. And it, in many cases, was actually quite true. More specifically, in instrumented tests, Ford found that their 1965 Fords were significantly quieter than a Rolls-Royce Silver Cloud at various speeds. At 40 miles an hour, the Ford was about 6 decibels quieter than the Rolls-Royce, and about 60 miles an hour, it was still 3 decibels quieter. Thus, with these results in hand, Ford and J. Walter Thompson introduced their ad campaign. While the body and frame design and the styling of the 1965 Fords was dramatically different from the previous models, there really wasn't much news under hood aside from the base engine, a new 240 cubic inch so-called Big Six that was a standard engine on all full-size Fords aside from the newly introduced LTD as well as the XL. Other engines included a 289 cubic inch V8 that made 200 horsepower, a 250 horsepower 352 cubic inch V8, 300 and 330 horsepower 390 cubic inch V8s, and three different 427 cubic inch V8s. A 410 horsepower version, a 425 horsepower dual quad version, and a 425 horsepower drag strip only version, none of which were sold with any power accessories. On the transmission side, Ford's two-speed ford o was dropped for 1965, and the only automatic transmission options were three-speeders. There were, of course, manual transmission options as well, both three- and four-speed, and an overdrive was also offered in some cases on the lower horsepower engines that helped improve fuel economy. Of course, there also were other visibly notable changes to the 1965 Fords versus the 1964 versions. Chief among these was the new styling that had a number of novel features, including stacked headlights as opposed to the dual horizontal headlights that graced the front end of the 1964 Fords. This stacked headlight theme was actually pulled from a late 1962 Mercury proposal, and it endowed the Fords with an overall handsome look, although one could argue that the look was a bit inspired, perhaps, by the 1963 Pontiac Grand Prix, which was Pontiac's first venture into the stacked headlight theme front ends. Another unique design feature of the 1965 Fords was that they employed curved side glass. This was not new for Ford or new in the industry. In fact, Lincoln within Ford had pioneered it in 1961, but Lincoln actually reverted to flat side glass in 1964 as it had so many customer complaints about water leaks. Apparently, Ford didn't have the same number of complaints as Lincoln experienced, perhaps in part because the curvature to the side glass was relatively muted versus what was employed on the Lincoln and thus didn't create unnatural pressures on the door seals. Overall, the 1965 full-size fours were really dramatically new from the ground up in terms of styling as well as engineering, aside from what was under hood. And they represented a pivot in Ford from producing vehicles that drove, let's say, a bit dated in terms of their overall road mannerisms to leading technology and class-leading quietness in terms of the overall driving experience. 1965 was also the first year for the LTD, which would be a range-topping Ford with a highly unique and bedazzled, if you will, interior with lots of button tufting and a great, rich look to it. 
Ford was so successful with the LTD that Chevrolet rushed to introduce its Caprice midway through the 1965 model year as a response. But that's a story for another day. Thanks for watching this spotlight on the Ford that was quieter than a Rolls Royce. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Check out the video thumbnails at bottom left and right for some suggestions for you. Thanks for watching.